Good afternoon. On behalf of Governor Cuomo, I want to welcome everybody to the Red Room. And we're very happy to announce that today the new superintendent of the state police, Joe D'Amico, was unanimously approved by the state senate. So I want to thank you. <laughs> superintendent D'Amico has a long and distinguished career in law enforcement. He started with the NYPD just before his 21st birthday as a B-cop, served 27 years with New York City before retiring to lead the investigations for the Attorney General's office. Uh, his career, I won't go through all his career steps, uh, just a great career. Uh, the commands that he has had, the real-time crime center he led before he left. Uh, he is somebody who is truly a cop's cop and somebody who no doubt will earn the respect of the great men and women of the New York State Police as he starts his tenure there. And one thing about Joe D'Amico during the transition process, the, the giants in law enforcement uh, that sent their views in about Joe D'Amico and the recommendations, it was tremendous to see the people that supported him and, and know him. He just has had a, a great, great career. And I just want to thank the State Senate. Uh, and I want to bring up uh, next, we have uh, speaking today. Oh, actually, before I bring it up, I want to mention that uh, with uh, Superintendent D'Amico today is his wife, Judy. I want to give Judy a round of applause. His son, his son, Joseph Jr., is here. His sister-in-law, Ann. And her children, Nick and Emily, along with many friends and colleagues who are here today. And so uh, it's with great pride that we welcome the superintendent. And I want to bring up uh, next uh, Senator Michael Nazolio, who is the chairman of the Senate Crime Victims, Crime and Corrections Committee. Senator Nazolio. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of Senator Skelos, Senator DeFrancisco, uh, Senator Gallivan, who himself was a captain in the New York State Police, and all members of the State Senate, uh, we are extremely pleased uh, to confirm uh, the Superintendent D'Amico today. Uh, he came before both the Crime and Corrections Committee and the Senate Finance Committee and was asked many questions, but this was one, that in the 12 years between 1995 and 2007, there were one superintendent of the New York State Police. In the last four years, with Superintendent D'Amico, there will have been four superintendents of the State Police. His response was that uh, his efforts uh, will be to bring stability uh, to that great law enforcement body, and we look forward to working with him. Governor Cuomo, we thank you for uh, this nomination, uh, the first uh, which we uh, believe certainly will uh, enhance law enforcement in our state and will make New York a safer place to live. Governor Cuomo, thank you for this uh, nomination, and we were proud to support it. Governor Cuomo. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. First, to the Lieutenant Governor, thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor Duffy, for your hard work on this matter. The Lieutenant Governor knows something about police officers, and when he talks about a cop's cop, he knows what he's talking about. He's uh, had a great tour of duty as a uh, police officer, as you know, in Rochester, so it's a pleasure to be with him. Senator Scalos, thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Mike Nazolio, Senator, thank you very much. Thank you for the quick action on this one. Uh, Senator DeFrancisco, also thank you very much. Senator Gallivan, thank you very much for being with us. Um, I'd also like to thank Judy, who is with us, who was acknowledged by the Lieutenant Governor, who was the partner and spouse of Joe D'Amico. Judy and I had several conversations about this position. It was one set of conversations with Joe. It was a much different set of conversations with Judy. <laughs> Judy needed a little persuading about the full context of this position and how advantageous it would be to join the state. And uh, I'm glad those conversations worked out very well. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Joseph D'Amico, I took over the Attorney General's office and I called um, New York City Police Commissioner Ray Kelly who was a personal friend of mine. I had served with Ray Kelly in the Clinton administration. Uh, he's a legendary commissioner of the NYPD in New York City. 
And I said, I need the best possible person you have to run the investigatory force in the AG's office, about 300 investigators. Uh, and they do very important work. Um, and I said, I, I just need the best that you have. Uh, and he called me back and he said, look, um, we did have a personal relationship. He said, the Attorney General's office is important. I'm going to give you a real superstar uh, to talk to. And I talked to Joe, and uh, it was clear that he was a superstar. He did an exemplary job in the Attorney General's office on every level, leadership, management, uh, product, performance, doing more with less. Um, and the office just had a tremendous track record of accomplishments for the people that wouldn't have, been hap wouldn't have happened uh, without Joe D'Amico. That he is the right person to lead the state police, I have no doubt whatsoever. This, I believe, is going to be a point where the state police can actually turn the corner and we can write a new page in the history of the state police. The first time I was in this building, uh, when I was a much younger fellow, uh, the state police were one of the premier law enforcement agencies in the United States. Their integrity was beyond reproach, period. You wouldn't even think about it. Uh, recently, there have been a number of, of disturbing uh, discoveries about the state police, not that go to the essence of the state police, not that go to the people who day in and day out do the work in the state of, with the state police, but there have been tangential activities, political activities that have tarnished the reputation of the state police. I think that's, that's a fair statement. That is an unfair characterization. It's untrue to the essence of the state police. And I believe with a new superintendent, you're going to see a new page written, uh, a better page, a truer page of what the state police are all about. Uh, so I am so excited. I'm excited for Joe. I'm excited for you, Judy. I'm most excited for the people of this state. State police are a very important institution. Uh, the work they do all across the state, the frontline public safety work that they do. Um, and it's going to get better after today. Ladies and gentlemen, let me please introduce Joseph D'Amico, and I'd ask him and his family to come up and join me for a swearing-in. Repeat after me. I speak your name. I, Joseph D'Amico. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office. And I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office. Of Superintendent of the New York State Police. Of Superintendent of the New York State Police. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. I just, <laughs> no, this is not a tax cap, Senator. I just wanted to see what Joe was going to look like. <laughs> so I've been thinking about this for weeks, I want you to know. Give it a try, Joe. <laughs> you <laughs> Let me just say thank you, Governor Cuomo, for this opportunity to serve and protect the people of the state of New York, and I'm extremely proud to be part of your administration. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank my wife, Judy, my son, Joe, and my family for their unconditional love and support. I'd like to thank all of my friends who made the trip to Albany here to support me and to be with me on this great day. In my 30 years of law enforcement, I've always 
considered the New York State Police to be among the greatest police agencies in the world. The State Police is a proud organization steeped in history and tradition whose members put their life on the line every day to protect us. We owe it to them to provide the leadership that supports their mission, their sacrifice, and the basic principles of integrity, commitment, and honor in the job. I now have the, the privilege of leading this dedicated team of police professionals at a premier law enforcement agency. It's a tremendous honor to be chosen to lead the brave men and women of the New York State Police. I look forward to meeting the challenges of my new position and helping to enhance the public safety for all New Yorkers in cities, towns, and rural areas, upstate and downstate. As superintendent, I will maintain our underlying values and ensure that we fulfill our core mission to serve, protect, and defend the people while preserving the rights and dignity of all. I thank all of you. Very nice. Questions for myself or the new superintendent? I think it's important to, to recognize that uh, what occurred in the state police was um, it was the actions of individuals. Um, it wasn't the organization. The, the institution that is, is the state police is sound. The overwhelming majority of the people in the state police are hardworking, honest, loyal um, employees. So I, I think it's important to recognize that. Um, I, I think what I'm going to say to the, to the membership of the state police is that our, our role is public safety. It's not. It's not politics. I'm an apolitical person. The organization needs to be apolitical and independent, and, and I'm going to strive to, uh, to send that message out to them every day. If I could just reinforce, excuse me, Fred, one second. If I could just uh, reinforce the, the point that the superintendent made. Um, to say it is the state police, Kyle, as you know, it's not about the state police. The, the men and women who work in the state police do phenomenal work every day. Uh, were there a handful of people who got involved in activities that were political, I believe, and outside uh, their duties? Yes. Were the state police put in a bad position by the requests from the governor's office? Yes. Uh, so it's complex. But again, it's not, it's not about the state police. And most importantly, um, I think what the new superintendent brings is a, a chance for that to be about yesterday. The organization is moving forward and it's m moving forward uh, under a supremely talented uh, and competent leader. Fred? Superintendent, as you well know, in December, I think 28 senior members of the state police got substantial pay hikes. They weren't made public, and apparently they came to something of a surprise. They were rolled back. Is it your intention to make any changes in the leadership of the state police? Well, as to the raises, I, I became aware of the raises shortly after my nomination. Um, I think that G Governor Cuomo's um, actions to rescind the raises was proper. I support him on that. You know, I do recognize that there are, there are issues in the institution when you, you know, you can't promote people up without taking a, a, a pay cut. Um, as far as the management of the state police, I'm, I'm taking this as a transition period. I'm looking at all aspects, and I've really made no decisions as to personnel moves. Other topics? Governor, tomorrow, obviously, Budget Day, you put out a, a, a statement today talking about uh, the practices of the past of trying to inflate spending and the handcuff governors. How much are we going to see in terms of total cuts? Are you going to cut the overall size of the budget as well as the, uh, you know, not only just what the rate of uh, growth would have been, but the budget itself? Uh, you're going to see some uh, interesting pieces in the budget tomorrow, Ken. 
Uh, we have some creative moves, uh, I think, to save money. We are talking about uh, subletting out the space in this building where the LCA currently sits. <laughs> I thought that was creative. Happened to be my idea, by the way. The savings will go on my ledger. Um, the, we're going to try to solve two things with the budget. There are two different problems. We have a, quote unquote, $10 billion deficit this year. What I was trying to make the point I, I was trying to make this morning is we have that $10 billion deficit because we have a budget process that brought us to a point where the Medicaid program is growing 13 percent and the education program is growing 13 percent. And when you spend 13 percent more in Medicaid and 13 percent more in education, you have a $10 billion deficit. Um, that has to be solved this year on the numbers. Secondly, we have to stop that cycle. And we have to stop the fundamental process, which is the quote unquote budget process in Albany, where the annual budgets are basically bandages. And the wound remains. The wound is a state government that spends too much money and has for too long with too little performance for the taxpayer that is causing businesses to leave the state. That's the problem. Growth that is unsustainable year after year after year. And then when you understand how the, the budget process really works, that the annual budget is basically a one-year sunset bill. And all of this work that's done for the budget is that one-year annual budget, but at the end of the year, it's gone. And then the next year, you start, and you have the same underlying problem, which was the quote-unquote Medicaid program and all those individual programs underneath with their prescriptions and their rates and their formulas, they kept running, and the deficit is going up and up and up. So this year, stop, close the gap, balance the budget, and then stop the madness, which is this process that is running up deficits that are unaffordable and will bankrupt the state. Critics have said today that uh, a lot of this trend setting, so trend factors, started with your father's administration, and they question how do you get rid of it when, for instance, education, a lot of it is CFE, with health care, a lot of it was the expansion of child and family health plus. What happens to those programs? Here's the fundamental difference, Ken. Their point is you have to continually spend more money at levels that you cannot afford, that are unsustainable, and that more money will equal better services. More money does not equal better services. More money does not equal more help for the people. More money is not equaling better education for the children. We're number one in education spending, we're number 34 in results. More money in the Medicaid program doesn't mean we have more wellness. I reject thoroughly, as a person who's been in state government, federal government, as a person who has run programs, built housing, run a not-for-profit, more money does not equal better services for the people. That attitude has gone on too long in this town. More money, more money, more money. No, better services, better services, better services. More cost effectiveness, more savings. Find out how to do it, but find out how to do it for less. No, we have to keep throwing money at the problem. No, you don't. And by the way, it hasn't worked throwing the money at the problem. And you can't afford to continue throwing the money at the problem because it's unsustainable. So let's try actually managing the process. So take those programs and say, I know I did this for 20 years. I know. We've been doing it this way for 20 years. We can't afford to do it this way anymore. And by the way, it's not working that well. So let's find a better way to do this. And see, when we talk about Medicaid, we make it sound like it's one program, Medicaid. Medicaid is 200 programs. One umbrella called Medicaid. But there are 200 or so programs under that, each with its own formula, its own rates, its own purpose, its own piece of legislation. What we have to do is stop those programs from running on automatic pilot year after year after year. 
So will the state spend less money next year than this year? Are you asking me to disclose vital information about the budget? You have to ask Bob Megan. <laughs> and Bob's not talking. <laughs> What do you expect the tone to be tonight at this 7 p.m. meeting in the mansion with the legislative leaders? Tone? Uh, baritone, probably. Uh, I wanted to have a conversation uh, with the leaders, the, um, all the leaders, uh, just to talk about the budget and talk about the context for the budget that's going to be delivered tomorrow, how we can work together. Nothing more than that. Governor, how much of the $10 billion is, is because of pre-existing Almost all of it, Tom. See, almost all of it. What's happening here is the law programs, we have, let's pick a number, 200 Medicaid programs. They are institutionalized in law. The law describes how those costs will increase over time either through cost, cost plus, et cetera, or a formula, an, an inflationary formula. And those, that law operates, and those programs continue year after year, Tom. Now, the problem is we could do everything we're doing to close this budget, right, and to close the $10 billion deficit. And you'll see tomorrow it's going to require extraordinary efforts on many people's behalf. This is a big number, $10 billion. It's a large deficit coming after they had several years of closing deficits where they took all the low-hanging fruit off the trees. It is going to be incredibly hard to close this $10 billion deficit. If we don't do anything, Tom, about the underlying programs, we finish this $10 billion deficit, we wake up to a $14 billion deficit the next year. That's the problem. You do everything and you close the $10 billion deficit, you don't even get to pop the cork on the champagne bottle, and Bob Megna will tap me on the shoulder and say, now we have to start on next year's 14. Why? Because those programs just kept running. We're going to have to stop the clock. We're going to have to stop those programs from running on automatic pilot. Well, they always did that. See, that's what they're saying back, Tom, right? Well, these programs have been around for a long time. And they've always been running. I know. That's the problem. And they've gotten to a level and a pitch that we can't afford anymore. And, by the way, that we should have never really accepted, right? The way this is supposed to work is you start a program, you evaluate a program, you review a program. If it's not good, it goes away. None of that happened here. Governor, the uh, Senate is about to vote, if they haven't already, on a property tax cap, the bill that you wanted. This is a full month before your mandate commission comes back with its recommendations. Is there any concern that some people would be a little skittish about having a cap in place before the mandate issue was dealt with? Well, it won't be in place, right? It will have been passed by the Senate before. But we've said all along, Nick, that the property tax cap and the mandate relief uh, have to work together. I understand the connection. doesn't mean you can't pass one until you complete the other. But for them to go into effect, you have to have both mandate relief and the property tax cap passed. Governor, what kind of advice would you give state workers who are hoping for protracted careers with state government? The, um, I think that public service is one of the greatest careers that you can have. The state is going through a very difficult time, um, and they should hang in there with us. They should listen tomorrow and get the facts before they jump to any conclusion. Uh, and I take this talk of layoffs very seriously. It's probably the most painful part of this entire budget process when they talk about the pain in the budget. To me, as you'll see tomorrow, there is nothing that is not manageable in this budget. Um, the quote-unquote real pain, to the extent there is pain, 
You talk about layoffs. These are people. These are families. This is uncertainty. Uh, this is real life, and that's where there's pain. So obviously I would do everything I can uh, not to create that situation uh, and to minimize that situation should it be created. When we, uh, back in November when the Senate was in flux and we talked about a 31-31 situation, you mentioned that uh, you believe, as many do, that the LG could uh, break a tie in leadership matters. So what's your take on the GOP's, the GOP majority's action that they're taking today to limit that role? I think they are incorrect on their reading of the law. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations.